Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Test Road channel. This week's topic is time travel. Specifically, a time travel novel that is one of my all-time favorites, which now has, hooray hooray, a sequel. Yes, this novel was mentioned in my 2020 Best Time Travel Novels video, and this was number two out of ten, so that's pretty good. This particular novel that I'm talking about this time, however, this is not only well done scientifically, but it sounds plausible. They really make it sound plausible, and so it is very much one of the best ones I've ever read. I'm talking about The Rise and Fall of D.O.D.O. -D -O by Neil Stevenson and Nicole Gallant. travel is a tough thing to write. A really tough thing because it provides so many options, so many opportunities, and so many pitfalls. Time travel has the problem of breaking cause and effect. If you can go back and change something, you've just destroyed that chain of causality, which can completely make reality come unglued, pretty much. And in some books, that is an interesting theme. Some books that can happen, but you can't do that all the time or people get barred with it. So that is one of the, what I consider to be like four types of time travel books. Four types of theories on how this is supposed to work. Number one is that time is totally malleable, so therefore time travel is extremely dangerous and very highly restricted or bureaucratized. And this is why we don't see time travelers popped in, because as people have said, if it exists ever, then it exists everywhere and all time, of course. And so this would include stories such as The Sound of Thunder, which is that very famous short story which popularized the butterfly effect. A guy goes back to the age of the dinosaurs, he steps on a butterfly, comes back, and human history has been changed. <laughs> The second version is that time is totally fixed, predestination, that nothing can change it, and that all these struggles come to naught. That can also provide an interesting story, but it's kind of a dead end. You know, you don't want to have too many of these. It's frustrating. It's like, well, why did I even bother to read this thing? I remember a short story that I found pretty interesting in which there was this young Jewish boy who had been bullied by his Gentile classmates, and when he grew up, he became a time researcher, went back to the time of Jesus, and ended up becoming Jesus. Because, of course, time can't be changed. Somebody had to be Jesus. <laughs> Third type is that time travel creates splinter timelines. And this is probably the most popular approach. It's the approach taken by the 1632 series, in which this American village is transported back into 17th century Europe by alien alien trickery, and so this creates a splinter timeline in which there are Americans back there bringing back their tech. So it doesn't affect our actual timeline. So that kind of solves the causality problem. Fourth is the one that they use in DODO, which is that timelines are changeable but with great difficulty. That is, timelines are resilient in, in my terminology. It can be done, but it has to be done exactly right, or the change won't happen. Second part of the premise of this story is that magic was once real, but it no longer works due to the rise of technology. Now, you do see this theme occasionally in, in sci-fi or fantasy books. In this case, it has a specific cause. Magic just didn't die out because people didn't believe in leprechauns or something like that. <laughs> it's more specific, and that's one of the things I love about it. The pivotal event in this world is that they photographed the solar eclipse for the first time in 1851, which is a real event. And that caused all these people saw it and it kind of fixed this event in history. Um, one of the other aspects of this is that the more people in whatever time witness something, the more fixed it is, the harder it is to change in the timeline. So in a way that seems arbitrary and another way it might not be because people witnessing something does affect the way people behave etc and and affect history so 
That's when magic went away. Now, the U.S. government, in its infinite wisdom, is funding all these weird research projects, most of which come to naught. But in this case, they are looking into the history of magic. And these researchers are reading these old legends and myths and thinking, maybe this was real. <laughs> maybe this is real, and for some reason, magic went away. So, thus is born the Department of Diachronic Operations, this ultra-secret project. And their idea is to develop time travel by bringing back magic. <laughs> and the idea is that certain women inherit this ability. It's rare, but it's there. It's like the Salem witches and so on. That these women can be put in this box. It's isolated from our universe by these quantum effects somehow. You know, they've got a superconducting coil around it and all that good stuff. And if they can be isolated, they can do magic in. The most desirable thing to do with magic is send somebody back through time so that they can mess with history and to favor the U.S. government's agendas. And so it does end up working. In fact, this Hungarian witch shows up and says, I've been living for 300 years so I can be in your project. <laughs> and they take her in. And they discover soon that um, timeline is resilient, that they have to do this multiple times in order to cause any effect. And to induce any kind of change in history, they have to do it again and again and again. These are more like time strands. As instead of these timelines being entirely separate dimensions, these are like time strands that contribute to the current reality. And this may kind of hurt your head to think about it too much, but I enjoyed it. The other weird wrinkle is that only living tissue can be sent back by magic which means you go back naked <laughs> without any tools or weapons or anything like that. And so at first, you know, the first person has to steal clothing and you know, contact a local, preferably a witch, and make her understand that we're going to have be sending more people back and you have to help us out. We'll reward you in whatever way. You know, we'll compensate you. So that's how it gets started. So a little bit about the authors before I go any further. Neil Stevenson is one of my very favorite authors. He's mostly a hard sci-fi writer, although he does work on historical fiction, though it is usually related to history of technology, such as the Quicksilver books, which started out around the time of Isaac Newton. He is from the Baltimore area. Uh, he's probably a couple years younger than me, and he's had, had a lot of books, like 18 novels at least. He comes from a very scientific background. His Father and mother were like engineers and biochemical researchers, and uh, all of his family was very smart and very technical, which is why he can do this. I mean, he's a smart guy, and he has all this knowledge to make these stories really great. He wrote my favorite steampunk novel of all time, The Diamond Age, which actually has elements of cyberpunk in it as well. He even worked on Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin project for a while. So... He must have some kind of scientific knowledge that he can actually work on space travel. <laughs> Nicole Galland uh, is somebody I hadn't heard of, and she mostly writes historical novels, some contemporary. She's written about ten, I think. She grew up in Martha's Vineyard, so she's got that East Coast vibe, which is where a lot of this stuff in these novels comes from. And so she provides more of the human side and a little bit more of a you know, romantic and or humorous angle. Because when Stevenson, Stevenson likes to put weird sex in some of his, whereas, you know, Gallon will have something that's more romantic and, you know, plausible for normal people. First novel, Rise and Fall of D.O.D.O., published 2017 by William Morrow, an offshoot of HarperCollins. Unfortunately, they're all big monopolies these days. Main protagonist is Dr. Melisande Stokes. She's a young and single historical linguistics uh, professor. <laughs> she, she researches like ancient texts and so on. Very impractical. <laughs> Very impractical knowledge and yet she gets contacted by this handsome, mysterious and dashing army major Tristan Lyons who needs her help for this top secret project. Uh, translating documents concerning magic. And so there's already a little bit of chemistry kicking off between the two, as you would kind of expect. And this book, it has 
a number of POV characters, which is usually a pet peeve of mine, but their voices are quite different, so it's pretty easy to tell them apart. So the technical expertise is provided by Dr. Frank Oda, a retired MIT professor, originally from Japan, and he is married to this uh, Yankee matriarch from a you know one of these Boston Brahmin type families and she has Salem witch blood in her veins <laughs> so she has some of this latent ability I forget her first name sorry but anyway they are major characters and uh, there's also other tech nerd type people finally one of the more important and interesting characters is the Hungarian witch Elizabeth Carpathy, who is the one who shows up on DoDo's doorstep saying, Take me in. I've been waiting for all these years. And of course, the first thing she does when she gets into the magical chamber is make herself young and beautiful. So she's able to like wrap men around her little finger. So as time goes by, they start monkeying with time, including things like uh, changing Russian history so that Ukraine conflict starts going America's way. Yes, I know you probably have read all the nonsense about Ukraine winning, but they're not. <laughs> so in this case, in this case, they've actually gone back in time to weaken Russia. Okay, probably, probably just as plausible as the stories we hear about uh, the Ukraine doing well. <laughs> but furthermore, as these things go by, of course nothing can go without a hitch or it wouldn't be an interesting story, right? So, one of the witches that they recruit and bring back from the past is an Irish witch named Grania. And she says, why should we listen to all these men? You know, instead, I want to plot with the other witches, and I want to bring back magic by stopping that eclipse photograph. I'm going to destroy technology, and it'll be a world where magic works, and we'll be in charge, <laughs> essentially. So, she's like the antagonist, and she's like, got the project coordinator, uh, Weasley little um, bureaucrat, she's got him wrapped around her finger because she's, you know, beautiful and petulant and all that stuff and demanding. And so the other characters have to try to stop her. Well, Melisande Stokes finds out. So Grania banishes her to Victorian England, <laughs> which is kind of cool. She gets to go to the Crystal Palace and so on, but nonetheless, she thinks she's stranded there. Uh, there are some interesting agents, time agents, and uh, of course everybody has to know some ancient language or customs of the time, they have to be able to act and pretend to be some character, some cover story, and they're going back and they are, are going through these, all these situations where they get to, you know, meddle in time. So it's very interesting and, and very exciting in, in places and, you know, danger and so on, so it's great. The sequel was published in 2021. It's called Master of Rebels, A Return to the World of D.O.D.O., something like that. And also published by William Morrow. But this one is written only by Nicole Gallen, so we don't have as much of the tech, of the cool tech as we do by with Stevenson, but still, she has to continue that, and so it's still pretty dang good. So, this continues the idea that Grania is still meddling. She hasn't been stopped entirely. Well, they've thwarted her a couple times. So what ended up happening was that several of the major characters from DODO defected and formed their own organization. Now, of course, the government's trying to stop them. They have to try and prove that they're meddling so that they can arrest them. And they've got this secret set up in uh, Frank Oda's house where he has created a new chamber for them to send people back. And so they're kind of monkeying with each other's timelines. <laughs> the different groups are at odds. So Melisande, who is also a major character here, she has to go back uh, to Pompeii uh, in Roman times because she has to say one of the ancestors of Leonardo da Vinci because he has a lot to do with the invention of photography, which Grania is trying to change. She has to go back again and again and again. It's kind of a fun sequence and a lot about Roman society in there. Whereas Tristan is sent back to foil Grania's other project, which is to bring back this really dangerous spell 
you embed this dangerous spell into the play Macbeth, which is considered by theater people to be cursed already. So if somebody with some latent uh, magical ability, would have to be a woman, recites the witch's lines on stage, something bad would happen. And so she wants to cause chaos. That's part of her aim. Now, I don't quite understand how Rania has weakened technology enough for this to be workable, but, you know, take it for granted that it's happened. So, as it happens, uh, Tristan is sent back to Shakespeare's time, and he's shot and possibly killed, at least in one time strand. They have to try to rescue him. But at the same time, Melisande is stuck in Pompeii. And she's having trouble getting out of there. So, to the rescue comes Melisande's younger sister, Robin. She shows up at the rival project, at the independent DODO, and says, what happened to my sister? And so they end up recruiting her, not to go back to save Melisande, but to go back to save Tristan in Shakespearean England, which is very cool. And that's where the Master of the Rebels comes in, because that's a guy who is in charge of all theater in the realm. He's kind of licensed by the king, and he, he can't, you know, he can't allow anything that's too subversive because the king censors anything that would be. And so Macbeth was kind of a problem because Macbeth made some bad illusions about the royal family, so, or at least the other royal family, so they have to make sure that they're not dissing the wrong people. Anyway, Robin meets William Shakespeare, and she hits it off with Shakespeare's brother Edmund and ends up being his lover. And she also has to deal with a number of pesky witches who have to aid her, and one which is in the court of the king, well, kind of secretly, because you know they, they would probably burn her at the stake if they realized what she would, it really was. So it's very complicated and, and it's very dangerous, and it's kind of funny because these lines are just slightly different. Like in Bubble Bubble Toil and Trouble, which is the where the curse is supposed to go in there, they change it to like, instead of cauldron bubble, it's like raise the rubble, and then they change several of the words, and suddenly things start happening in the 21st century. Theaters start catching fire and people get blown up. So this is, it's, so it's interesting. It's, it's got a lot of historical stuff as the previous one. This is less technical, more historical, and the format is a little different too. It's all of mission reports and journal entries. So, at this point, we have to do the pros and cons. Pros. The books are a great, plausible sounding way to work with time travel. The Resilient Timeline is definitely my favorite of the four alternatives for time travel rules, for the rules of the game. I love the historical research that went into this, the way that it seems real, the verisimilitude. I love the variety of fascinating settings, such as, you know, Roman Pompeii, medieval Japan, Constantinople in the Byzantine times, all that good stuff. Uh, Mel and Tristan have an interesting kind of stormy relationship. There's some dark humor, including where people die, but that I've got kind of a sixth sense of humor, so of course. Uh, so there's a little bit of sex, but not too much to get in the way of the actual storyline, and the rules restrict what the time travelers can do, which make the story interesting and makes sense. Cons. There are always cons, unfortunately. First of all, there are too many POB characters, which, you know, is one of my pet peeves, but again, their voices are rather different. Also, in the audiobook versions, they have different narrators reading the different characters. I don't care for that. I'd rather just have one person read it all. Seriously. There are, of course, some things that seem like plot holes, including, you know, what Granny is up to, how she can kind of bring back magic, but not entirely. Not quite sure how that works. Some of the characters are a little annoying. Robin can be a little annoying at times. And she's such a, I don't know what, she's such a, a perky character. Another one that can be annoying is the Yankee matriarch, Oda's wife. She's always doing these journal entries with the weather. Oh, the wind is five, 15 miles per hour from the northeast. Who cares? It's because as a character, she is into gardening, and she's always worried about a garden. Still, it bugged me. <laughs> and plus, you know, it's kind of a domineering, a liberal white woman thing. I mean, she just kind of rubs me the wrong way. Sorry to those liberal, dominating white women out there. <laughs> 
And uh, finally, and this one I don't see mentioned in any of the reviews, but to me it bugged me. The sequel, it basically marginalizes, kills, or incapacitates all the male characters. It's all girl power. Not so explicitly, but, it, but seriously it does get to where the women are doing everything. Now, we have already have women being the only ones who can do witchcraft, so, you know, it just went a little too far in my view, and I'm, hope, I'm hoping that if Nicole does another one, I will read it, I will definitely buy it, but I'm hoping that she brings back, you know, some of the male characters in a way that they have more of a role, so it's not so, quite so one-sided. As far as ratings, I would give this first one five out of five gears. A fantastic book, very gripping, very interesting. It's got its own unique spin on time travel. Definitely check it out. I would say the second one, I would say between four and four and a half, I'm having a hard time deciding. Uh, because of most of the problems that I cited, most of the cons were for the second book, I'm afraid. <laughs> but anyway, it was still good and still worth checking out. Please let me know what you think about this in the comments below, or perhaps other comments on some of Stevenson or Gallen's works. Please like and subscribe. That does help us get this channel more popular and uh, spreads the word about steampunk being back, which of course it is. Please also check out my writings on Amazon. I will put the links in the description. I do intend to get some more out one of these days. I am working on it. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.